Nemoidians Jar Jar Binks and Yoda for episode one were sculpted by this chap, Gary Pollard. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, you were the lead sculpting artist on episode one, weren't you? I was the key sculptor in the creature department, yes. So what does that mean? <clears throat> uh, that means... Uh, in a nutshell, I get the pick of all the best jobs. So things with a lot of political responsibility, if you like, you know, creating Jar Jar either as a, a CG or a physical suit, um, revisiting the new Yoda, which is a big responsibility, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. and creating another key race of villains, the Nemoidians as well. Get a lot of uh, very uh, the most interesting high profile work, but then again, there's an awful lot of um, uh, things riding on it, lots of opinions, lots of clients, lots of producers and creators. You know, all have an opinion, so it can be quite a roller coaster ride of ups and downs to try and get to that thing. So I have to be mature enough to take criticism as well, you know, and then uh, find the right thing that pleases all the parties. So it's not always plain sailing. As a lead, did you have to do all the talks with George Lucas and other heads of department? I did have some creative meetings, yes. Um, one of them, of course, was with Yoda and Frank Oz and the producers and George came along as well. And um, they saw my concept sculpt of the Yoda that you saw in bronze, which is also the one that was presented to Stuart. Oh, that is fantastic. That's incredible. That is fantastic. Um, and they liked him. There was a good comment from Frank Oz. He said, give him less neck because he was looking a little youthful. So he made me hunch the shoulders like right up and right like coming right down like this and making him appear a lot older, which is a great comment. But otherwise, they completely bought it and they liked it. What are the <clears throat> challenges of bringing that back to life after so many years? Uh, well, the main key decision was, do we update him or do we do uh, an absolute replica of the one that was? Now, we'd felt we were moving from foam latex technology into a lot more silicon work, which is translucent. And also the style of sculpting, no disrespect to the original sculpt, but it was actually quite crude by today's standards. And also I like to introduce uh, more anat anatomy and realism uh, in the sculptures as well. So we made the decision to update him, which I, in retrospect, I think it shouldn't have been that way. What were you saying there about lost in translation from the sculpting process? Uh, yeah, sometimes that happens. Um, Sometimes I get to see a sculpt all the way through into the shooting and throughout the build and make sure that it goes together with sort of the right dynamic that I intended for it. Everything I intended for the character, I think, comes through in the concept sculpt. You can see like a twinkle in his eye, the right kind of age, a bit, as I say, a bit more anatomically feasible, a bit more like a real creature. Um, but when he was constructed, the silicon was a bit out of shape. Um, his eyes didn't look good or natural. Uh, and I think he didn't look, if you put the two things side by side, uh, it doesn't translate. You know, he looks quite different from what I intended. And the, you can see that. So that's like one that got away in the build. He's such a crucial character. In a way, I'm surprised that George Lucas led it through too. Uh, yeah, well, they all liked it and they all shot on it. You know, I, I would say that they liked it and shot on it. But mind you, George didn't really mind too much about what he shot because he knew he would alter it you know drastically all throw it out so he shot wherever he liked and but for a while there uh, it was in the movie Yoda is such a crucial character who did you have to impress the most uh, it was between George Lucas and Frank Oz they both had to like it and of course George wanted Frank to be happy with what uh, was now happening to Yoda so it was between those two and uh, they did both uh, sign off on it with a few little changes what was the presentation process? Did you have to go anywhere special and display what you'd made? With uh, Nemodians, I had to go to George's office because that was quite a portable item. But um, I had a, a, a sculpting room that um, George and Frank came to when they came to see the, um, the Yoda concept sculpt uh, with the camera entourage from the producers as well because everything and everywhere that George went was filmed and kept on record and everything that he said was on record. What were your feelings when they went in and digitised the version of Yoda for the Phantom Menace? Uh, he was um, more faithful to the original Yoda, and it's quite possibly that's the way it should exist. But then again, you know, the digital one was no more real, so you're sacrificing practical effects with digital. So in either way, you and you you don't achieve a real realistic creature. You recognise him, 
But he, in his design, he's very cartoony as well. So he doesn't convince you that he's a real creature at any point. He's just a well-written character. So Yoda's, you know, not real either way as a convincing monster. Going forward with Yoda, what do you recommend they do for the future? CGI or back to sculpt? Uh, again, the best combinations are the right things to do. You shoot practically and then digital, digitally they have to match that. I mean, they don't like to do that. They don't like stuff in camera that they have to match to. They'd rather create it all themselves from the ground up. But sometimes, you know, they forget to add gravity and physics, don't they? When they digitally do something all the way. So back to a practical puppet that's faithful to the original and then digitally copy that. Gary Pollard, you sculpted Yoda for The Phantom Menace. Does that mean you also sculpted Yaddle? We did do Yaddle, yes. So uh, that was a younger Yoda creature. Uh, they decided in the end that he was quite effeminate looking because the way that the hair was done. Um, so he ended up being a girl, I think. That That's is. right. What's their direction with... Uh, there's a massive mop of hair on that thing. It is indeed, yeah. I mean, there was a sketch of him that just had a few strokes of hair coming off like a bit of a Mohican. But they just kept, uh, you know, plugging hair into it until it was like quite the main. But, um, yeah, I mean, he worked as well as the others. He still, you know, he had a nice youthful face and clear eyes, but... Uh, if he's going to change sex, then it was ru- largely irrelevant. So, Gary, is Yedl and Yoda the parents of Grogu? <laughs> I have no idea about that lineage, so uh, I'm perhaps the wrong person to ask. What is your specialty in sculpting, Gary? Um, on this case, it was um, uh, the creature effects. Uh, so... Um, my main interest in the Phantom Menace was <coughs> with the Nemoidians because one of my favourite things to do were, is to extrapolate alien races, which means I get like the, the, the blank, the generic, if you like, uh, and then we get like the hero, which is like uh, Newt Gunray here, but then uh, his whole race, which is like, you know, the, the, the scared one and the, and the fat one and the old one and the... And the the, the, the coward, cowardly one and the young one and it's just that all of those things like really bring a lot of joy to me uh, to do you know especially challenging with this chap who is like you know he's got no nose he's got strange eyes uh, he's got like, you know like an, an inhuman brow no ears so it's like how do I show character in this thing now they're all bad guys but you can't have them all looking the same so all you've got to use is the chin shape uh, and and uh, the cheekbones and the foreheads and you know to to, make, to sell the character, so Newt Gunray is a delight because I gave him this jutting jaw and this horrible like, you know, like jutting sort of forehead and a mean sort of cast to his face and that was great to do and then I can choose the colours that go with it, you know like some of his cohorts have got different sort of variations on that, but um, the differences between the, their characters is an absolute delight to do for a sculptor. Do you know what George Lucas's starting point was for the Nemoidian species? Yeah, it was that. I think it's Rick Baker Cantina, wasn't it? Oh, the uh, Juros. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think he chose those, and, he's, and he he wanted to do them CG, for, but for some reason changed his mind. Uh, and then it came down to us. So he said, "I like something a bit like this." So I took that, and as you can see, the similarities. But then I just again developed character into that, so you could read different facial characteristics. As you were sculpting, were you working from this Doug Chiang concept art? Uh, sometimes, but then he was up for free reign. You could just uh, put your own self into it, and I, and I kind of do that quite fearlessly. I just inject whatever I feel the character needs and what I think they're looking for, uh, and I don't mind if they don't like it. But I just can't resist, you know, sort of pouring suggestions into the work, and I do that all the time. Sometimes it works. When I did the first concept of this guy and his race, we went to George's office to discuss what he thought of it. And there was, he made a comment on my paint job that it was a little too Mars Attacks because I had brain veins, a little bit veiny. Yeah. So he said, soften that. And it says, you've caught him. That's great. Gosh, he's got a good eye, doesn't he? He does. Well, yeah, you know, he doesn't say much, but when he says it, he's like, that's what I want. Oh, well, that's not what I want. <clears throat> but also, the producers followed him around with the camera all the time so he couldn't ever deny he'd said something. So they recorded all of his decisions all the time on camera, just so it's like, nope, that's what you said. I guess it's a lot to keep track of, isn't it? How do you actually integrate animatronics into the mask making? Uh, well, uh, as you're sculpting it, um, the animatronics department are on, on the, 
the project. So they see what you're doing and you start to discuss what movement potentially it might have. So they can see what's coming and what space can be available inside it to make that work. Uh, and we developed a great system where they put their servo motors into backpacks uh, and, and, and take the weight off their heads. So it's not packed with motors, which is quite handy for the performer. And it doesn't limit you by having to make enormous sort of heads to accommodate lots of motors. So they, you know, they, they were so excellent at their jobs animatronics wise and the collaboration, which is lovely, they really kind of share information. They asked me about where the jaw might be hinged in an alien. Uh, I asked for nictitating membranes that flicked across the eyes and how, how the whole thing might uh, perform as a character, which is great. You know, that means I can, I can keep an eye on that. And we're all on the same page right to the end, which is wonderful. What sort of considerations do you have for the performer inside? Uh, that they can breathe, not necessarily they can see so well. Quite often we try to give them a little enough to see the floor. But to be honest, um, in between takes, they're led around like, you know, like they they're can't see anything and they're like little babies and they're sort of blind. You know, in between, they're like planet invading monsters, but uh, during the takes, that is. But, you know, after that, they've got their hair dryers stuck in their mouths and everyone's bustling around them and trying to give them some air. It's never easy, but we try and make it comfortable as a priority. But it's quite an endurance test for some actors sometimes. How many different variations of Nemoidians did you do? Uh, six or seven, including a generic one. Um, you know, it's like Lot Dodge of the older guys and then uh, Rune Harko, the, the, the sidekick. And then um, there was... Um, one that was like terrified and you know, it was great to do different characters. What are the differences between the variations of Newt Gunray and Rune Haku? Uh, again, both villains, but uh, he's got this aggressive look to him. He's got that profile, which is kind of in your face and mean. However you look at him, he looks mean. While um, Rune was a bit more just scowly, miserable. He's got everything, all his lines like this kind of uh, uh, nothing's ever any good. Like, just, uh, sad sort of wrinkles to him, you know. Like, not happy about anything. Just, just a misery guts. <laughs> so you've got aggressive guy, schema, and then misery guts his sidekick. Yeah, sort of a bit of a coward he was too, wasn't he? Absolutely, yes. But there's one that, that um, Palpatine's going like. Viceroy, I don't want this stunted slime in my sight again. Get this slime out of my sight, because he's blubbing about something, and it, he even had yellow skin because he was like. <laughs> no, the terrified one. I think you've actually um, modelled some of it, it after your own look. <laughs> I can tell. The mirror's very useful. <laughs> and also, but I, as a sculptor, I draw my data from everyone around me yeah. all the time. Yeah. You're all my database. They've gone up the ventilation shaft. And what about the one, uh, the, the Nemoidian with the goggles? Uh, yeah, that was good for us. Well, it has to be generic, which means you can use him in the background. He's non-functioning, he's foam. Oh, the others were uh, silicon nanotronics. He let me put on this sort of uh, navigational goggle model, so I got to give him a little sort of build, little model build, which I wasn't used to, which is quite sweet as well. Gary, I love Nemoidians. I hope they make a bit of a comeback. Do you? I do, yes, thank you. Yes, I quite like them. I mean, they were rebuilt in the third one, um, but it, it wasn't the same. Uh, you know, they lost the jutting jaw, they painted in bright green, which he wasn't, he was blue. So I didn't like that version, and I don't know quite why they did that, but... Um, yes, I'll stand by my original guy, so I'd quite like to see him back. Sir, a transmission from the planet. Are you brain dead? This is incredible! Key sculptor of The Phantom Menace was Gary Pollard, who got to work on Jar Jar Binks. Tell us about that. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, another popular chap. <laughs> Uh, well, the first task was George wanted to see how much of him could be a physical suit. But um, I was given these uh, digital drawings, um, but and he had a very, very thin neck. The rest of him was basically humanoid, so you could see how it could possibly be changed into a man in a suit as, a, as an approach. Um, but how can that neck work? So I did the first um, faithful um, clay sculpture from um, a wireframe uh, drawings that I was provided with, so that's quite accurate. And then we attempted to wrap it around a human being. So I had to expand the neck, try and make a feasible throat that hid a human face, but was still, you know, very like the Jar Jar without losing too much. But he thought it went too far away from his original drawing with a slender neck. So he went digital. But we still had to make a man in a suit to capture lighting and movement from a live performer. 
When you say his drawing, do you mean George Lucas there or Doug Chiang in the art department? Uh, the art department, yes. Yeah. Now, there's also the series of photographs online. When it comes to sculpting Jar Jar, did you work from any of these early markets? No, not at all. Mine was the first, um, you know, sculpt into the real world, if you like, from wireframe pictures, printouts. Was it a long process, the pre-production of Jar Jar? Um, not as far as we're concerned, no, you know, because I'm, I'm not a slow at sculpting, so, and we've got, we know what we're doing about wrapping um, aliens around people, yeah. so we can produce something for an opinion quite quickly. After that, you know, over to the digital people. Because we've actually seen a photograph just recently released of Jerome Blake playing Jar Jar Binks, or Qui-Gon Jinn, in fact, behind him. Uh, at that point, they're still trying to use it with, uh, there's a, a guy with a cap on. Right, yes. Well, I don't know if it was Jerome, was it? It was like someone, another different performer. Yeah, I think Jerome was in the shot, but just behind. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, well, you know, they still use a lot of them. We still had a, a tight-fitting bodysuit, which moved beautifully from the fabrication department. Yeah. And I was involved in the bodysuit scope for that and some of the other guys as well. But yes, you know, you've still got this bit uh, added to him, the top of uh, Jar Jar's head, where it would be, so performers can find the eye line, um, the correct eye line for that alien on set. What about these concept art pieces from Terry Whitlatch? Did you ever see these? Uh, no, not aware of any of those. That's obviously my sculpture. Is that the final sculpt? That's the sculpt. True, you can actually see the wireframe in the background, as well. That's what I went from, and uh, that's my sculpture. True to that. Now it looks like this crew member is doing the paint job. That's Kate doing the paint job. Yeah, Kate Hill. She had all those little orange squiggles to do all over it. She took a bit of amount of time, but she's a very skilled painter. These battle droids here, a lot of people online tend to think it's all CGI, but here are some actual physical shots of the props. Are the props firstly sculpted? Yes, of course, yeah. They're all sort of built first, aren't they? And uh, I mean, obviously all the digital guys like something physical to use as lighting references. Did you work with Doug Chiang at all? Because he was pretty much high up in the art department, wasn't he? Um, no, because the interpretation of, of Yoda was new. That was left to me and to Nick, Nick's opinions. But Nick used to leave me alone artistically. He used to give me free reign between me and um, the boss, which is George Lucas. So the only artwork I really got was um, that first Jar Jar. And again, the Mordians were established because he said, use that cantina, aliens, your starting point. Uh, and then I extrapolated it to, to this, the, made these changes and then, um, you know, found out what the rest of the race would look like. So I didn't get much in the way of design supplied to me. Which is actually, you know, the way I, I like it. I, I grasp what they're after and then run. You're pretty much a, a freelancer, aren't you? I am indeed, yeah. A bit naughty sometimes, but you know. <laughs> so I, I, do th I do try and help, you know. I think I know what they want and I do try and bring something to the table each time. Were you a Star Wars fan before you got the job? Uh, more of a Trekkie, <laughs> if I'm honest, but um, there's plenty of good stuff. In, in the films, isn't there, to, to love. And in any film, if you think it's generally weak, there's always great moments that you can enjoy. And since J.J. Abrams taken Star Trek and Star Wars, a lot of it's merged together a little bit, a little bit. A little bit, of course, yeah, it's going to, isn't it, yeah. I mean, more explosions everywhere. What about your future, Gary? What do you hope for Star Wars? Can you get back into it in the future? Um, yes, I, I think I'll give it a go, yes. I think a little bit more in the script writing, you know, not, not so much about silly decisions i mean you can't cover up a, a silly plot decision or a serious omission about how something happened um or lack of originality in the storyline you know like you're, you're trying to sabotage a big weapon again okay fine um if that comes back and um you know in those moments where it's not all about things blowing up but you get one-to-one -one, um fighting a bit like the maul and the jedi thing and you, yeah it all takes off then doesn't it, it becomes personal and not just about spectacle. But see, I've seen it in Rogue One, all that personal stuff work, the Vader stuff was awesome, the tech was great, all the machinery and the, the fights were uh, much more realistic and it, you know, it just felt real to me. And, and everything was logical in a way that you could understand. So if we get the writing back, um, then I'm in. Sounds good to me. Key sculptor for The Phantom Menace, Gary Pollard. Cheers, mate, and thank you for bringing this fella in. He's oh, terrific. You're welcome. I think he's quite happy to be here, aren't you? Yes, he says. <laughs>